And welcome to How to Be Friends with Dave and Sean. Hi, Sean. Hi, Dave. This week's episode is not, in fact, uh, sponsored by um, Warcraft or, or Blizzard or Hearthstone or anything. This is just what we've chosen to do after last week's wonderful hot dumpster fire of an episode is we're determining what else we can do while we hang out and put our friendship in the universe for the better of mankind i uh i hear you're having a having a warm one up in the pack northwest oh yes so the great thing about that is so this is the pacific northwest um and the wonderful thing about the Pacific Northwest is that we're supposed to enjoy nice, mild, even keeled weather. Summer never gets too hot, winter never gets too cold, yada, yada. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm on board with that. So today's high was 118 degrees, which is at a level stuff. Holy crap. Yeah, that's a little toasty, dude. But we are the only place in the world where you can go to, let's call it 120 degrees, drive a couple of hours and get to 60 degrees. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, any place that is, I mean, I guess I wouldn't say that you're the only place in the world, but yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, yeah, I, just, I was like, oh, it's super hot. I'm going to take the kids to the coast for our last weekend together. <sighs> anyway, uh, we take the kids to the coast. Because it's super hot, which was a good idea because we were able to get like super chilled at the like 65 degree beach. Um, That's nice. Yeah. See, when it gets hot down here in the valley, we usually just go up to Mount Charleston if we can. And you get to get the cooler temperatures of the mountains. Mount, Mount Charleston. Was that made in Carolina? No. No. <laughs> So, uh, for those of you who are participating with the podcast, first off, thank you very much. Secondly, um, if you missed last week's rampaging rantings, that's okay as well. Uh, the idea, of course, of derping along with this game as we go along is that, um, well, hell, uh, we can still talk about whatever. Uh, I've got a couple of questions from um, our good... Uh, our biggest fan, Colonel Sutherland, against again, which I would like to start with. Um, how are you doing buying an F fifteen, Sean? Well, oh. I, you know, luckily, mm. F 15s don't have thirty round magazines or flash suppressors or anything like. As far as I'm aware, I can legally purchase an F fifteen. You might not be able to fly it, but yeah. You could own it. The point, of course, is that our our dear sweet president, our, our bumbling dear, crazy old man of a president, dear sweet man that he is, um, broken brain and everything was like, yeah, you think you didn't? You need an AR-15, take on government. You need F-15s and nukes. What? Yeah, I don't think so. So first off, the subtle implication is that he's going to nuke his own people. Not so subtle, I should say. I didn't get that vibe from him. I think he's just a old man talking and talking and talking because he's got hairy legs. He hairy got legs. hairy legs. He's got those hairy legs. I don't think that he meant it as an overt threat by any means. No, you're correct in that. However, uh, the the reality of it was that that's the whole taxation argument. Uh, of course, uh, taxation is enforced at the bare of gun. By saying you need nukes and F-15s to fight the government, uh, that he's saying that's what the government would use against you. Yeah. Yes. Which is tasty. Which is also hilarious because when was the last time we did actually use the F-15? Desert Storm. <laughs> <laughs> nice! 
So I guess if, if you're Egypt's Air Force, maybe? Yeah. A couple I mean, of decades behind there. So we have that wonderfulness. And I, I like how he thinks if you're going to fight the government, you need a jet. Because, cause like, I have a landing strip. Like, <laughs> Right. And this, of course, being the same government who has been at war with people in the desert. I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming, by the way, do I get some type of experience for this? Yeah, I do. I do. Oh, yeah. You get all sorts of awards for this. Okay. All sorts. Of, don't worry. And I'm going to switch decks each time so that, you know, you get your ass kicked by a different... How do I how do I get new packs? I have to finish my apprenticeship. I don't know what my apprenticeship is. They're just gonna walk you through stuff. It's you do you you, you want to make a, a different deck real quick? Well, I don't really care. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm gonna beat your face in a bit more. That's how. That sound all right? Yeah. To get back to the question of um, our good Colonel Sutherland. Uh, so how do you think that the gun buyback in Australia went here, Sean? In uh, effectiveness and national security in Oz. Oh, I don't know. I'm assuming there was resistance. Oh. Uh, it was a funny question that, it, 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 if you're listening, let me get to the point of this, because there is there are some things to disassemble. Would you like to take a guess, Sean, what connects my frustrations with the vaccination lottery and gun buybacks? What's, what's the direct connection between the two? Well, if you and Mr. Yeah, I was from taxes. Taxes. That's right. So as as a person who tries to be consistent, if I to be pissed about there being a lottery uh, for people who get their vaccines, which means taking some of my taxpayer dollars and incentivizing people to do something that it, it, you, you should not be buying people off for, I, I'm pissed off about that. I will also be pissed off about the idea of taking my taxpayer dollars and giving Bubba $800 for a 22 caliber tube, a nail, and a spring attached to a broomstick. The heck happened to our game? I don't know. That was weird. Oh, that was weird. Yeah, so, I've never understood how buy gun buybacks work. Like, is there just one number that they give for every gun? In terms of price, yes, yes. Uh, they'll they'll set categorical prices. A shotgun will be like, you know, four hundred bucks. A rifle will be eight hundred bucks. A pistol will be, you know, two hundred bucks. Whatever arbitrary price that they place, it's just. It, let let me put it to you this way, Sean. Let let me something that you disagree with. All right, uh, Fords. Okay. Fords are terrible cars, right? Let's do a Ford buyback. And that this Ford buyback is going to work is that um, I'm going to take you $400 out of your pocket for the government to take a Ford off the road because they're unreliable pieces of garbage. How do you feel about me going to buy back Fords? I mean, there's a lot of Fords out there that aren't worth four hundred dollars. <laughs> Precisely. So I can. I, I what can, the heck, man? I, I don't even know. I'm not even worried about that. But I can hear the argument that you want to control guns. You write a person a check. Go buy a gun off the shelves. It's nearly the same thing. I mean, I guess in a world where. I, I like. I guess you'd have to regulate that, right? Because would it have to be an actually mass-produced firearm? Because if you live in a country where you can legally make a gun in your own home, um, but you can't legally then sell that gun. But if the government's doing a gun buyback, doesn't that mean that if I made a slam-fire shotgun at a forty-dollars 
worth of product from Home Depot that they would in turn have to come around and buy it for 400 bucks. Bingo. You hit it on the nose, Sean. You got it. Because that's exactly what happens with these gun buybacks, at least in the United States. That's why I made the joke about Bubba with a 22 caliber tube nail in a spring. Be- that because that's what happens. People will fabricate, people will 3D print a gun. They will be just making whatever that can fire a bullet and getting the government to give them taxpayer dollars for it. So using the Ford analogy, if you put a rubber band powered car with uh, four wheels together, slapped a Ford logo on it and discovered it was still faster than the Mustang, you the government would buy that back from you. Right. Ford because it's hilarious. Uh, I have seen a lot of Fords in my day that wouldn't be. I mean, so what was Australia? How did Australia do it? Like, what was the amount they gave? Like, do we have any specs on that? I didn't look it up, honestly. Too many headwinds to be doing research. Let me call the producer to get that going. Sorry. I... But it's, it's irrelevant because of the fact that hey, it's still going to be an arbitrary number. Now, they rounded up a bunch of weapons doing that. I guess to answer the good colonel's question more specifically. Okay. So, the historical case was they had a mass shooting. Uh, and they were so pissed off at the mass shooting that they, they did the gun buyback and banned firearms and so forth. And anti-gun people afterwards were like, hey, look, it worked. There are no more mass shootings. Okay. Which is the tiger repellent principle. Yeah, I don't see any tigers. The tiger repellent must work. Right. Or you just don't have tigers. (laughs) Right. They didn't have hardly any before because yeah in fairness i mean australia didn't have the violent crime that this country has and this country does have a stupid amount of violent crime it does fact um i guess i don't know those who are arming up against the government i'm not gonna lie you might get the first swing off. Right. I mean, you you might catch the government with its pants down. Maybe. Right? Right. Oh, I used that on my own people. That was dumb. That's okay. I'm Um, so proud of you. And then when the government comes in with armored personnel carriers and automatic weapons, you're going to learn real quick that it doesn't matter how many AR-15s you own. (laughs) Right. Uh, the reality is that let's say, what was that show that, that you watched back in the day, Sean? Jericho? Oh my god, yeah, that was so good. I, you know, I, I couldn't get through all of it, but yeah, mm. I appreciated the denouement. Um, it, it, it provided a lot of unique perspective on how you actually take on the government. It, the, these preppers out there, the boog, what are they called? Boog boys and all of that? Boog boys. <laughs> it's like, good gravy, guys. It's it's a war of a... It's not friggin' putting claymores on your Roombas. It's taking the battle strategy of Al-Qaeda, the battle strategy of the Viet Cong, and applying that. It's Wow, this, this thing is busted. Yeah, I mean, when you're fighting, if you're trying to fight the U.S. military who is mount training, I don't know. (laughs) Right. I don't know what you expect to happen. But let's back up a moment and let's go with good old Sleepy Joe. Man, this is just not working for me. Let's go with good old Sleepy Joe and and his idea. Okay, so he he doesn't like what's going on with the people. He's going to go ahead and enact martial law. Um, how how many precise minutes do you actually give the U.S. military members of fighting their own people? 
Uh, it depends on how badly their own people are fighting them because regardless mm. of your nationality, mm -hmm. if I see you taking pot shots at my buddies, True. I'm, I'm smoking you. True. That's just the way it is. I think you get, probably got to think of it more from the Warno situation. From the, okay, we're going to go lock down Detroit situation because we don't like all of the guns in the street. And at which point the questions start to come out. Excuse me, please. Why is the government doing this instead of the police? Do you see what I'm saying? Just a second. Hey. Sorry, I'm running out of time. I got to end my turn. Um, so your question is, how long will the government fight its own people? No. How long will the uh, soldiers fight their own people? Based off of Civil War rules? No. Quite a while. Based on these circumstances, the yeah. You do what the government says or else. Uh, I don't know. I honestly couldn't tell you. I think if this civilian public is being a dumb enough group of assholes and basically become terrorists, I think they'll fight them for a good long time. Interesting. I do. So... I don't think it's I don't think it matters if it's your fellow countrymen. If you as a whole, as part of the United States government, view even your public uh -huh. that you're supposed to protect as a threat to the United States as a whole, I think I don't think they'll hesitate to fight them. Sean, I think you're saying pretty something pretty damn insightful. Okay. The obvious case of that is let's go back to the boob boy. I think there are a bunch of if a bunch of boog boys uh, rose up against the government, I honestly wouldn't have uh, a hard time putting that down because that's just like the government is bad, blow it up kind of people. Right. I'm not down with that. No. Uh, just by the way, my, my game is freezing. Yeah, mine has been trying to reconnect for one minute. Okay, I'm going to see if I can exit this. So that's a circumstance that I can do. Now, there's a, a lot of people, and rightly, by the way, I think, a lot of people complaining about the woke of the military, right? I don't remember which general it was, but some general recently got in trouble for getting up in front of Congress and talking about how uh, he's interested in finding out about white rage and, and what caused January 6th and so forth. Yeah, I believe his comment was, I'm white and I don't understand white rage. And I think the reason he was saying that was because of everybody saying stuff about it's white rage and it's white. And he was like, as a white person, I have no idea what you're talking about. It wasn't quite. It wasn't quite. But that's a good take for it. Um, the, the specificity of it is he was just saying, well, why not learn about it? Well, and it, it doesn't hurt. That's right. I mean, to better understand yourself is, is, is always insightful. Right. Unless it's a bunch of drivel bullshit. But let me split that around for you, okay? Here's, here's what I want to bring that back to. Okay. So we're talking about, of course, um, <laughs> January 6th, right? January 6th, everyone is all up in arms about, no pun intended, because a bunch of people without arms took over the, the Capitol Hill for like a couple of hours, right? Right. And it, it was the most peaceful insurrection in history. It was stupid. I'm here to say it was stupid, but the only shots fired were by like the rare capital police that still stuck around. You know? Right. So by the peaceful insurrection, you're referring to the one where the cop died, right? Yeah, there was the, the cop that died um, from... It's very peaceful as an insurrection, yes. Hang on, hang on. He wasn't the one that was shot. 
No, he wasn't shot. No, he. There was some fighting. Um, he got hit, um, and I don't think they ever released the exact reason that he died because it was not directly related to. They said it was cardiac issues. Right, like he had underlying issues, and he probably right. shouldn't have been on the riot patrol. Right. Right, and being beaten up by a group of rioters probably didn't help his cardiac issues. Right, but of course, uh, there was a rioter who was shot to death. Um, and again, I'm not condoning anything. I'm just, like I say, you brought up a really good point, so I'm just kind of putting it together. It was not a failure of democracy. 100% it was not a failure of democracy. In fact, our democracy was resilient on that day because everyone went home and they continued to do what they were supposed to do that day. Right? Right. Uh, nothing burnt down. There were actually people shown cleaning up after some dumb people. Um, yeah. You, we could say, oh, you know, it obviously wasn't peaceful because, you know, a police officer did die. I'm not condoning that. But I'm saying, take, take it a little bit further. We are now saying that white supremacy is the greatest threat in the nation on January 6th, which was a relatively peaceful uh, insurrection compared to how they're framing it. Uh, as far as I know, aren't they saying white supremacy is the issue because a lot of the people who organized and backed this whole thing were tied to white supremacist ideology? That's the claim. Okay. And that's why I want, that's why I'm highlighting exactly how peaceful that was compared to say for example all of the riots in 2020 that just happened generally throughout the summer where many people were shot and killed and lots of people were there were millions upon millions maybe billions of dollars done okay and i, I promise i'll t and tie this back around sean i just want to keep making okay sure we're on the same page with things. okay oh. Okay. We're saying that... Ah, oh, fuck you. On occasion. We're saying that the biggest threat to the nation is white supremacy based on January 6th. Okay? That is ignoring all of the threats that we had over 2020 that were far worse. Cool. All right. So I'll stick with it and say... All right, whatever. That's why this general wants to study white rage. Fair. Okay? Okay. So you say to me before, you say, okay, so um, the military has to be sufficiently motivated to be able to fight. Now it's actually a little bit more concerning to me because of just what we're talking about here. If you frame something that happened and went away on its own, because again, it wasn't a failure of democracy, it was a failure of security. So if you you have something that happened and went away on its own, you're calling that the big threat and you go down that rabbit hole, I could see that being a dangerous framework. Thoughts? So you're saying it's a dangerous rabbit hole to frame Domestic terrorism is domestic terrorism? No. <sighs> no, it's not prioritizing correctly. Because what 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 happened on January 6th wasn't domestic terrorism. No, it was if I'm I not viewing it like that in any way. Right. If anything, um, it was a failure of people to just evacuate the capital and limit conflict. Yeah. It, it, like, if you can't secure the building properly enough, you should at least be able to, like, you know, evacuate it. Right. Uh, I have to emphasize over and over again that that makes the point of where the security failure was that there just wasn't enough uh, capital police. On there wasn't enough anything on hand to be able to handle what happened. And that is, of course, why I emphasize something that happened and then went away, uh, which is a really strange framework for for 
like we said, if we if you want to frame that as domestic terrorism, it was weak domestic terrorism because it happened and it just went away. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I, and again, I want to clarify this because in this exact same podcast, um, huh, I have also decried the Boog Boys who want to bring down the government. Okay, so I, I want to clarify that I don't, this is not a new conspiracy that I, I'm making. I'm just saying if, if you're asking questions about things, kind of see the patterns that can happen. And if you can't recognize the patterns, you can't stop the patterns. No. So, no. Do you want to know what the pattern was? Hit me. It was a, just a bunch of wackadoos who all felt that their president was speaking directly to them through the television. Which, by the way, was... <laughs> yeah, okay. Stick with me on a minute as well. The people who actually raided the Capitol were there before President Trump had finished his remarks. The people who were actually at the Trump rally, they did the math based on the distance. They would have had it been moving at like 18 miles an hour in order to be part of the actual raid on the Capitol. Right. So... I have my issues with Trump's rhetoric, despite having voted for the fella twice. I do. I think you and I have mentioned before in the podcast, if the dude could STFU for five minutes, uh, he would he would have been reelected. Even even if there there was voting irregularities, skullduggery in the voting, even in this case, uh, he still would have been reelected, re and in fact, uh, that was proven in 2016. I'm I'm 100 convinced that uh, Hillary Clinton was just cheating every which way that she could, and our democracy still worked. But all of that being said, um, if I'm going to condemn some of his rhetoric, some of the most ravenous Trump supporters need to be more rational too. Oop. It would have helped. If, uh -huh. if I'm going to say Trump could have closed his claptrap, same for, same for, it's, Sean, I believe I mentioned before, joke that it's not Christianity that has a problem, it's the followers. Right. So, there we have it. That got down the beaten track of. <laughs> Sorry. Bless you. Let me let me let me bring it back together. One more thing. So if you're watching to this point, Colonel. Gun control works in Australia and New Zealand because they're surrounded by what what what? Water. Uh, emu. <laughs> emu. We uh. We, we don't exactly get a whole lot of gun running in and out of Canada. But heard tell stories that the southern border is a little porous, so to speak. Yeah, uh, Operation Fast and Furious. Ooh, that's going back. So yes, for those of you who don't know, there was this hilarious effort made by... Um, President Obama's Department of Justice to try to find cartel. It, it was it was the worst idea. In an effort to try to find cartels where they were located, they tracked the serial numbers of guns that they sent to the cartels. Right. Only to discover with, with a pocket engraver, you can take the flipping the number off of anything. And right. It, so they just gave guns to the cartels. And then a border patrol agent was killed with one of the guns that was part of the operation. Which is 
Those poor Border Patrol agents. I'm kind of glad you didn't get that job, by the way, Sean. Kind of glad. It would have been a good job for you, but I think it's just keep getting worse and worse for law enforcement. Yeah, I was talking to my wife about that, too. She's like, do you still want to work in law enforcement? I was like, well, at this point, everyone hates you. But the right. good news is apparently nobody wants to be a cop. Maybe they'll start paying more. How? <laughs> then the question comes, how much pay do you have to make to put up with the current environment? <laughs> Mm, I don't know. I was talking to one of my coworkers today. He was a cop for 24 years. He goes, it was it. He goes, if you worry about somebody popping you in the back of the skull, it goes, you'll last about a week on the street because you're constantly paranoid. He goes, what you stress about is putting your hands on somebody and getting sued. Mm, yeah. You know, hilariously, I don't know if I told you about this. Okay. Um, so I, I, I've, you know that I've spent a couple of nights in jail, which is hilarious because like, until my ex-wife, speeding tickets were my worst criminal action. Um, and boy, howdy, I had to have a good attorney to get through all of the stuff she put. But to get to the point, <laughs> uh, so my first, very first um, arrest, Sean, you probably would have giggled a great deal at. They were pretty chill with me. You know better than I do that, um, you know, you get like a background of certain places, right? Like, you know, we've been to this address before, blah, 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 right? Correct. It, you know, it, first time a, a beat cop goes to um, a certain place, uh, you know, there, there's, and then every time after that, they were like much more terse with me. I don't blame them, but you and I talked about how the policing system isn't racist. There's just a lot of assholery. That was assholery. What is that? What are you doing? Nothing. I was just trying to figure out what I'm doing. I know you're going to kill me in the next turn, and it doesn't matter, but... Right. So, look... Hilarious. You should get a giggle out of it, Sean. So I actually asked the cops in my first arrest if I could bring my Game Boy. They said no, didn't they? They were pretty kind about it. They were like, yeah, they're not going to let you have that in there. Yeah, I mean, you can bring it with you, but it's going to be checked in during processing. Right. So it's kind of pointless to bring it with you. Right. Now... But there's a reason I bring this up, not only because it's hilarious. You'd be like, hey, can I play this while I'm sitting in there? It's, it's jail. No. You get a pencil this big to sit and scribble on things with. Anyway. <laughs> so, you know, they book me, right? As they do. I, You know, I'm a little nervous. I've never been there before, you know, assuming I'm going to get plugged in the butt or something, right? Wow, that's positive. Okay. Well, it's just... Have you ever seen the Shawshank Redemption? Uh, yes, I have. Poor Andy Dufresne. Poor Andy Dufresne. You know, this is, it's just like the military, you know. Uh, <laughs> movies make the most dramatic of the military. Movies make the most dramatic of jail and prison. And that stuff. Most, most people who have been to prison say prison is just boring. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> of course, so is this this there, and he's like, "All right, uh, so I'm gonna pat you down. You don't have anything that's gonna poke me, stick me, cut me, whatever." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no," because I didn't think, right? And of course, because this is related to what you're talking about—the the real, the real concerns of police officers. They're much more worried about getting damn HIV, you know, than, than necessarily something else, right? Okay. He searches my pockets and he goes, oh, what the hell is this? And I'm like, he said, something just poked me. Like, what that? He's like, I'm going to take this out of your pocket if this is a needle. And I'm like, if this is a needle, what? I'm going to be raped? <laughs> What's the next part of the sentence, right? 
<laughs> it turns out it was the damn stylus to my Game Boy that I'd forgotten left in my pocket like a moron. <laughs> I like the fact that you were arrested with a Game Boy stylus in your pocket. How many times do you think that happens? Uh, rarely, I would imagine. <laughs> Not rarely. That being said, as I as I get further in nursing school, which is going okay right now, by the way, it's going okay. As I get further in nursing school, um, I am kind of fascinated by the, the various options available, honestly. Um, going to a rehabilitation facility, uh, SNF, uh, whatever that you want to call it. Um, I thought that was going to be the worst part of nursing, but like I'm running around seeing patients like who really want their lives back, who really want their capacities back, who really want to get healthy, get back home to their families. My heart went out, right? Um, so the point is, of course, healthcare across the board is important. No one piece of your health is better than the other. I think it would be fascinating, pardon me, to, to be like a jail or prison nurse. I think that job would suck. You're probably not wrong. You're probably not wrong. Name for me a nursing job which doesn't suck. Pediatric nursing. Are you kidding me? As much as I would love to do that, honestly, that's one of the things I'm thinking strongly about. As much as I would love that, give me one friggin', you know, dead two-year-old and I'm gonna be just tore up and down. That's the easiest patient to lose because they don't like they don't like leave a wife and kids behind. It's not like they have outstanding debt. <laughs> it's not like their spouse has to call around and get copies of a death certificate and be like, <laughs> hey, I got. It. I got to pay off Billy's Chrysler Pacifica. No. It's... Why a Chrysler Pacifica? I don't know. I just imagined Billy as a Chrysler Pacifica. <laughs> we just took the tank. Episode, what is this? Episode 127 of How to Be Friends with Dave and Sean. We ensure our place in hell. Oh, Mama, if you heard that joke, just laugh at it. Just laugh at it because it do funny. It do funny. Oh no. <laughs> hmm. So yes. And by the way, while I, I think you could get just like anything else, you get desensitized to it over a period of time. Death's a part of life. That's just the way it is. And I think oh, for sure. I think for every kid that you help nurse back to health, that definitely offset it. it there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. Uh, it's something that I've, I've felt in dialysis before. I, I, I don't know if we mentioned it, but of course, the biggest reason when I speak to people who have gotten out of dialysis, the biggest reason that they ever say for getting out of dialysis was not being able to handle losing their patients. Right. Right. You know, dialysis has this unique world where you get to know your patients very closely. You see them three times a week for several hours every time you get to know them and then they die either they don't come back or they're like, you know, a cold mass underneath your hands after there was no bringing them back, you know, via CPR or whatever. Right. Right. And for any new healthcare professionals listening to this and now horrified at this, this idea, um, here's, here's what I'm going to say. How I got through that is not necessarily by getting used to it, such as you'd say. Um, but, uh, doing my damn best, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's all you can do. When we, when we lost that feller in Bosnia, uh, yeah, it was kind of intimidating because it turned out he was a mucky muck. Um, but we did our best. So the Bosnians saw that and that felt good. Or you did your best. I kind of freaked out i just <laughs> i just stuffed a hose in the nose that's all i do 
magical display. If that's how you do it. Air, gas, and spark. The only difference between human beings is cars. Is people don't mind when you leave the car on the side of the road when you've given up on it. <laughs> Uh, yes. And that's truer than you would think. I've had some wonderful conversations with my classmates. One of my classmates' uh, father is a, a veteran paramedic. And yeah, uh, sucks to be honest, but if you come on a car accident and there's a person like cut in half underneath the car but still alive because they were cut in half and you know nothing can bleed out so long as the car is there it's dank but it's like what are we gonna do are we going to work this person just to increase their suffering or are we going to move along and let nature take its course we move along and let nature take its course <laughs> right you say hey 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 I got good news and bad news. <laughs> the good news is you don't have to pay taxes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news is it's because of the other guarantee. Yeah. Oh, so much dank this episode. You pull up on the accident and there's shopping bags in the back and you see a box of Nikes and you're like, I have good news and bad news. <laughs> Oh, I got good come news back is again. you can return those Nikes. The bad news is because <laughs> your feet are gone. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, okay. And I, I just, just to close this up real quick, I did actually cite you to um, the same classmate in, in talking about how medicine works and how you made an excellent, excellent um, medic because of exactly what you're talking about. You were raised in mechanics um, at the very basic level. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what was that? What? I'm just making you sad. Can't just kick my crap off the board. I did. I kicked him off the board. Uh, <sighs> sorry. Anyways, yeah. continue. So, yeah, it, keep it simple. Until you get to pharmacology, which is the worst. The absolute worst. Now... Sean, to the point of grifting. Grifting? Grifting. Would you like to give our audience, all 10 of you, a definition of grifting? Like matchstick men grifting? Ha! <laughs> if you are a cynic who is portraying one thing for the explicit purpose of personal gain, no matter how altruistic your appearance may be, you're a grifter, right? Okay. All right. So if you're trying out for the, the U.S. Olympic team hammer oh, throw. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> And you place third, and you know exactly where the camera is. I mean exactly. And you've got your makeup all perfect. And when the national anthem comes along, you turn away from it, and you look directly at the camera, which you know is going to catch you. And you put on your pouty face because they set you up. You are not actually genuinely upset at the country who by the way let you compete for them no 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 you are grifting because guess who's gonna get the next nike deal yeah yeah the third place hammer throw athlete who nobody heard about until she did it her makeup looked at the camera and pouted right because they played the national anthem which is they set her up uh, oh. by playing the national anthem. We we've had we've had some discussions about narcissism in the show. If you think that the national anthem was played in front of thousands of people 
for every athlete there at a scheduled time on that day just specifically to piss you off and no one else, you're a narcissist. Yeah. Now, didn't they? Now, why did they play the national anthem? Because uh, they were competing, right? Yes. To qualify for the Olympics? To represent the United States at the Olympics. So they were all Americans who were competing. Yes. And then all three of them placed. And then they played yes. the national anthem. And she, she felt her... set up. <laughs> she at no point was like, as an American competing in a sporting event, do I expect them to play the national anthem at any given time? <laughs> now, just to illustrate, I really do want to illustrate. I've never been <laughs> to, ah. to, to a Little League game. <laughs> ah. Never been to Dodger Stadium. No. I've never been to a hockey game. I've never been to a... <laughs> A cornhole game <laughs> where before you do anything they say please rise or the national anthem or the national anthem so what did they set her up for they're like hey before you go out there when they say please rise she was like yeah she's like don't worry it's gonna be beyonce and she's like oh okay i'll go with that <laughs> so they're gonna play all the single ladies after all of us compete to qualify for the olympics yeah we're gonna play all the single ladies don't you worry your little heart <laughs> And then she got out there. She was like, oh, they screwed me by playing the national anthem. <laughs> Sweet baby. Now, was she saying, now, what was her problem with them playing the national anthem? Uh, because the United States is a horrible um, that is just trying to screw every single person of, of any particular minority over and over again repeatedly. So why does she want to be on the Olympic team? Which brings us full circle to grifting. If she should be bitter about anything, she should be bitter about the fact that in the long run, nobody cares that she did it. She should be oh. bitter about the fact that a man doing the same thing <laughs> would earn 30% more the attention than that. <laughs> oh, oh, shots fired. Shots fired. Like if you if you're complaining about equality, why don't you complain about the fact that when an NFL player does it, everybody actually gives a shit, right? And when you do it, nobody really cares. It was just a slow news day. But I'm I'm still calling. I am still calling. Sean, how much money do you make being a third place qualifier to the Olympics? I don't know. Do you even go to the Olympics? Like, are you like on the bench, like just in case? Apparently, the third place qualifier will. Okay, so when Katie from Des Moines pulls her ACL, Mine. throwing throwing something, right? Then, like, she might get the chance to compete. Like, she wants to be the next Carrie Strug, right? Is that what she's going for? Uh, I have no idea who that is. She so. just she wants to be the underdog who gets injured and then somehow wins. Like when is the yeah, last? Sure. Okay, when is the last time the hammer throw was broadcasted? I don't think. Correct. You know what? I I'm gonna go ahead and call out that this woman is a hero. Nobody talked about the hammer throw until she threw a fit. When Light onto her sport. Let me ask you a question. In the last Olympics, do you remember who, who took gold in the hammer throw? I believe that was Nancy Kerrigan. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, of the <laughs> Olympic sports that people care about, like, I don't. I don't get it. You just you just want attention. You do want attention. And this Sean. Some things have been depleted. Some things have been wore out. Some things have become aggravating. But this is still, I'm going to say it. YouTube might ban me for this, but it's still the best country in the world. It is. America's the best country. I like Iceland, but yeah. I'm a fan of this one. You can't visit Iceland without sinking the place. What? Why? Because I'd be that one extra person that drives it into the ocean? Yes. They can't. Didn't 
Didn't you see Eurovision starring Will Ferrell? Which is a wonderful movie. They don't have the infrastructure to handle fame and fortune. The whole plot of the movie. I'm not kidding you. Watch it. It's, you might like it. You might not. I don't know. But that's the whole plot of the movie. Let me get back to the point. Because Iceland isn't better. Because Iceland, if someone decides they want Iceland, it's theirs. Iceland isn't stopping that. That's what, that's what I think makes Iceland so nice. It's like everybody's chill there because who wants it? Like, there's no stress. You really just say Iceland's chill? I hate you. Um, pun intentional. Let me get back to the point. So, I'm not even go, going to go with the most extreme example. The most extreme example would be China. I actually want to go with our good friend Russia. If you were a Russian athlete and you pulled this crap, how do you think that would go for you? Well, see, that's the thing. Like, I don't understand why everybody cares. So she got upset. Whoop de doo. Like, I don't know. I don't understand what stand you're making. And, and I say that because, like, oh, he took a knee during the national anthem. Yeah, and then he played a game and made half a million dollars. And that's fair. I don't care. Why is that's everybody fair. making a big deal of it? Sean. He's he's pointing out the injustices in society. Yes. Yeah, that's fair. When he drives home in his Bentley <laughs> to his huge ass mansion, thank right. God he's pointing out injustice. Oh, you you you're yes. It is fair. It's just the tie back to grifting. It's totally disingenuous. I actually think if if I'm going to follow a a um, conspiracy theory, I actually think that it was uh, Colin Kaepernick's lady that got to him, kind of wilted him. Poor guy. Wow. See, that was was that the hot take of the night? That was woman fight woman fight him. Ah, uh, you know, let's go with it. Woman splained him. What? Uh <laughs> that will not be the hottest take that we have. That's not the, that's not a good take. It's not. It's probably slightly less offensive um, than dead babies. Just saying. I didn't say dead babies. I said dead children. <laughs> you got me, Sean. You got me there. There's <laughs> <laughs> nothing funny yeah. about dead babies. You win. You win. Dead children. Something, something. <laughs> like the difference it's... between an enzyme and a hormone. <laughs> How dare you? There's a world of difference. Enzyme is a catalyst. It lowers the energy required for a chemical change to happen so that it can be efficient enough to maintain homeostasis. Whereas a hormone is clearly a DNA message sent within your bloodstream, Sean. No, the difference is you can't hear an enzyme. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's like take a note. <laughs> I'm gonna tell that is going back to nursing class. school. <laughs> 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 oh, I had to. Oh, I've got a joke for my classmates now. <laughs> While we're, while we're saying sailor jokes, I have to bring up the classic. The classic, Sean. What's the difference between chickpea and a garbanzo bean? I've never had a garbanzo bean on my face. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. I What's knew. the difference between a peeping Tom and a pickpocket? Hit me. One, What's the difference? One snatches watches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those of you who are listening, we will let you put that together. You haven't gotten it already. It's tastier that way. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'm about to die. It's it's all good. This will actually probably be our last round. I don't have a timer on this, so I'm going off at nine o'clock. We're coming up at the the very end of things. Um, so while while I beat your your frog ass. Read one more time. I, I will say once again, um, all of y'all who are participating, continue to participate. 
uh, Colonel Sutherland, if you listen to uh, this point, if you ask a question, I, I hope we have illustrated in this podcast, if you ask a question, you're going to get an answer. Without, without fail, you're going to get an answer. Might not be the right answer. <laughs> it might be messed up, uh, but you're going to get an answer. We promise you that. Um, and it's probably going to lead us down some rabbit trail that's going to get real, real wild. So, um, you, we've got our emails. We've got our Twitter that you guys still haven't tweeted to Sean. Do you know how many nights I've had to console his tears because no one's tweeted him? Zero. Because <laughs> I don't actually get a good chance to console you. <laughs> Hold you in the loving embrace of my massive thirteen-inch pythons. My 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 bosom. Hey, maybe you should compete in the hammer throw. Uh, you know, if I apparently if I uh, changed my gender, I could compete and win. You know, there's a lot of places where you work and you get a uniform shirt, and if you're male, you have to tuck it in, but if you're female, you can leave it untucked. Where's the equality? I just want to know. When I argued that I should be able to wear my shirt untucked, and they said, you're not female, I was, and I said, says who? Ah. <laughs> We're killed to work. It's 111 outside. Don't make me tuck in my shirt. And, and sweet baby Ray, no offense, Sean, but you do not have the body shape for a tucked in shirt. You don't. No, I don't. It's like I'm sorry. It's like a pair and a sweater. Ah, uh, pair. And a... Nice wool, itchy sweater. Uh, uh. Wrap this up so I can go pee. Okay. All right. So, uh, in addition, if you guys want us to play any games, please recommend something that can be turn-based, or it won't break Sean's brain. With with that said, uh, Sean, thank you for this. I needed a good distraction tonight. Thank uh, you, sir. I'm just holding on a little bit, watching you shake for our fans. Yeah, I really got to <laughs> pee. Have yourself a good night, Sean. You too, bud. <laughs> Bye. Bye.